7 News starts with breaking news. I've confirmed exclusively the parole officer who failed to track down Evan Ebel, the man who killed two people, including the state prison's chief, is getting new responsibilities. He's among the nine parole officers chosen for the DOC's new Fugitive Apprehension Unit. My Call 7 investigation finding it's the third specialized unit he's been assigned to, despite the recent murders on his watch. You may remember Ebel was a fugitive himself, an absconder on the run. My Call 7 investigation was first to expose time cards showing Ebel's officer worked half days and took the weekend off during the five days Ebel's ankle monitor was sending alerts and Ebel was committing murder. First, killing Nate Leon for his part-time delivery uniform, then posing as a pizza delivery man to murder former prison's chief Tom Clements at his front door. I asked DOC spokeswoman Allison Morgan how they justify their decision to promote the parole officer who didn't immediately start tracking down Evan Ebel, a designated high-risk parolee who was supposed to be under intense supervision. I'm still waiting for an answer, but in the past, DOC has maintained the officer did nothing wrong because protocols for tracking absconders were never clearly defined. Parole was given an additional $1 million by the Joint Budget Committee last month to fund the new unit. In this email to parole employees sent last night, which I've obtained, Division Director Steve Hager says the Fugitive Apprehension Unit will reduce the number of absconders and send a message to any parolee who contemplates fleeing supervision. Now, I did hear back from the DOC within the last 30 minutes, and they tell me that they cannot discuss personnel matters. They say that everyone on that new unit will be held accountable. Now, I have not and will not identify any of the parole officers in deference to their safety. I am still working this breaking story. I'll update you on the 7 News app and tonight on 7 News at 10. And if you have a story for me or any of the Call 7 investigators, call us at 303-832-777. New information tonight as the Call 7 investigators continue to break information on the Department of Corrections. As we exclusively reported, the parole officer who did not track down Evan Ebel got a promotion. And now one state lawmaker telling Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta he questions the judgment and transparency of managers in the state's parole division. I think we have uh, a lot of issues within Department of Corrections. Senator Kent Lambert was the only member of the Joint Budget Committee to vote no on the Department of Corrections' nearly $1 million request to fund a new fugitive apprehension unit, a solution many other legislators hurried to endorse following the murder spree of parolee Evan Ebel and our series of reports exposing the catastrophic errors made by the parole division. I've just got a lot of questions for them about their management process. He couldn't ask them. The DOC didn't send a qualified representative to the hearing. The committee approved the request in June anyway. Just over a month later, nine elite officers were chosen to fill the new slots. My sources confirm one of them, the officer who failed to track down Evan Ebel. Lambert told me in an email that raises even more questions about the judgment and transparency of the current DOC parole management process. Apparently, DOC pressed on with that appointment with no further explanation to the legislature. He goes on to say, the decision to assign the officer to the new fugitive unit makes you wonder who is calling the shots in the DOC and whether their decisions should merit the confidence of the legislature. As a result of our report, Senator Lambert is pressing Pressing the DOC for answers on a number of questions regarding the way parole operates. Legislative hearings are coming up in September, but I'll have new information for you on parole's ability to keep you safe this week. I'm Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta. I'm covering you information into how quickly an alert is sent when dangerous parolees cut off their ankle monitoring bracelets. Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta pushing for answers for months now. And Teresa, this is a critical question about public safety. Since parolee Evan Ebel went on that killing spree, we have never gotten a precise minute-by-minute -minute explanation from the state's parole division on exactly how the CYS alert system that electronically monitors parolees works. But after seeing my series of investigations, Senator Kent Lambert got the most specific explanation I've seen to date, a timeline that prompts even more questions about how effective the CYS system really is. The questions sent to the DOC from the Joint Budget Committee dig into several issues put under the microscope by our series of Call 7 investigations, like the use of GPS ankle monitors and the need for safety equipment for parole officers. I am concerned about what I think are fairly simple, straightforward questions. Senator Kent Lambert asking what happens when a parolee doesn't check in with a third-party monitoring system and an alert is issued, something that happens with parolees thousands of times a month. Either we have a major software problem or it's not being used correctly. It's not being managed correctly. 
The DOC tells Senator Lambert alerts are sent to the monitoring center after 30 minutes for GPS and 60 minutes for RF monitoring devices. That's a minimum 30-minute grace period before the system takes any action on the state's most violent offenders. The monitoring center then works the alert for a minimum of an hour for sex offenders, two hours for others, before ever attempting to contact the parole officer. Then the monitoring center makes the first of three attempts to call the CPO. After another 45 minutes, they try the supervisor three times. And after 45 minutes without a response, finally contact the person on call. That's a total of four hours. And in the worst case scenario, like with Evan Ebel, it's possible no one would have responded. Something is definitely wrong in the system. I want to know if it's a computer problem that we can fix by better communication, or is it a management problem that we need to fix by better management? After we first exposed Evan Ebel's parole officer ignored several alerts for days, the DOC enacted a new policy that officers must respond within two hours. But what's not clear is how this potential four-hour series of steps by CWISE factors in. Does that actually create a six-hour lag in response time? Precious hours, the state's most dangerous criminals could go unaccounted for. I'm Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta. The Call 7 investigators uncovering something at the Department of Corrections that may surprise you. Parole officers and other division employees working second jobs. New at 10, Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta asking if this could be contributing to the parole department's performance. But we're not getting solid answers. When high-risk parolee Evan Ebel dropped off the grid unsupervised, committing two murders, we wanted to know how that could happen. How could a dangerous career felon simply go unaccounted for? We heard a lot of excuses from the DOC. The officer who failed to track Ebel the week of the murders, even getting a fresh assignment to, ironically, a new fugitive unit formed as a result of his errors. We heard from sources within parole that same gang unit officer assigned to Ebel had a second job, and I've learned he's not a alone. We uncovered at least 47 full-time parole employees are moonlighting with the DOC's permission. Security guards at Pepsi Center, servers at a local bar, even a real estate agent. One parole officer even putting in hours at a McDonald's. We received a total of 47 permits for outside work granted by the parole division this year. The official forms for second jobs are supposed to be filled out and approved every year. Some requiring seven day a week responsibilities like this dog breeder. Not exactly the type of jobs you can walk out on when you get a call one of your parolees is on the run. The majority, 26 in all, parole officers, including those assigned to the specialized gang unit and team leaders, demanding jobs requiring around the clock availability. The DOC won't let the interim parole director, Steve Hager, sit down for an interview. But here's what his predecessor, the only person fired after Ebel's murder spree, had to say to the Call 7 investigators. Is that something that's, um, that you would say is fairly common, not surprising or unusual? Well, I'd, I'd say it, it, is, it is common. It has been common over the years. Are there ever conflicts that arise, and, and has that been a, an issue at all for you in the past, managing those outside jobs? No, I really can't uh, recall uh, really any issues that uh, come to mind. Now there's some indication, uh, some serious indications that there have been lapses of an egregious nature. Our series of Call 7 investigations now prompting questions from State Representative Daniel Kagan. How have those been addressed? What has the Department of Corrections already done? Uh, to uh, improve the situation and make sure these lapses don't recur? How is the public safety being protected? These are the important questions that we want concrete answers to, and we're going to insist on them. The chair of the House Judiciary Committee will ask those questions during hearings at the state capitol Thursday and Friday. He tells me the topic of how employees are accountable for their time will be on the agenda. But when I asked the DOC, they were defensive. What is it that you want us to respond to here? I don't think we're getting there, and it feels like we're fishing around. So um, I'm not fishing for answering answer your questions. I'm trying happens. to understand what. It, All right. I'm trying to understand what a CPO does and what flexibility they have and what checks and balances are in place to make sure that their primary responsibilities are done to the best of their ability or to the expectation of their supervisors. Yeah. So if there are other jobs that are allowed, I think the taxpayers have a right to know that, don't you? The administrative regulation for outside work is on our website. 
Let me emphasize, the new executive director, Rick Ramish, will not sit down for an interview unless we submit questions in advance, which we never do. But his entire agency is being compelled to answer questions at the state capitol this week. I'll be there, too. On Call 7 Investigator Teresa Marchetta. And our partners at the Denver Post with a four-part investigative series into the Department of Corrections Parole Division, part one published in today's paper. And you can find a link to that investigation as well as more information about tonight's Call 7 investigation on our website, the Denver Channel. State lawmakers scrutinizing weaknesses in the Department of Corrections Parole Division. Weaknesses exposed by the Call 7 investigators following the murders of two men by a high-risk parolee who was supposed to be under strict supervision. Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta at the Capitol all day today where lawmakers wanted answers. And you're telling me that there's no standard associated with what you have to do once there is a conflict. The Joint Judiciary Committee drilling down on a lack of policies, one of several weaknesses in the parole system exposed in a series of Call 7 investigations, now the subject of legislative hearings. I'm just a little concerned that there may be some abuse of discretion. Accountability among parole employees also on the minds of legislators hoping to unravel the web of errors that led to the murders of Tom Clements and Nate Leon at the hands of parolee Evan Ebel. They have to come from somewhere. It's not like we manufacture them out of thin air. They actually have to come out of the Department of Corrections. At issue, the systems used by parole not only to track parolees. So is this technology ready for prime time? But also to track their employees. Are the people within the system actually performing at the levels that they expect them to? And, you know, why don't we have better supervision within the system? The committee hearing from the state's probation experts about reforms to their intensive supervision program that relies less on electronic monitoring that failed in Ebel's case and more on officer inmate relationships. The supervisors are really our linchpins when it comes to quality assurance. They have a variety of reports that they can pull that indicates whether or not contact standards are being met. DOC Executive Director Rick Ramish wouldn't say yet if he's considering similar reforms. Uh, I don't think it's fair for me to discuss it until I'm before the committee, but what I can say is the corrections you, can, you see today will be much different starting tomorrow. And Ramish kicks off the agenda for tomorrow's hearing for another day of tough questions from lawmakers looking for evidence of change from the DOC. I'm Call 7 Investigator Teresa Marchetta. The Call 7 investigators at the state capitol as the Department of Corrections answers questions in front of the Joint Judiciary Committee. I was the only TV reporter in the hearing from beginning to end. Two full days of testimony questioning parole division managers after our series of investigations exposed catastrophic errors. It's hard to imagine a worse situation than what we've gone through in the last year. It wasn't an easy day for the Department of Corrections. You've heard Steve say a number of times this is something we're looking into, almost to the point where it's it, it's kind of getting embarrassing. Executive Director Rick Ramish and Acting Parole Director Steve Hager facing questions like this for hours. So the follow-up isn't being done now. There's no documentation of it. There's no evidence that, that all of these great ideas are being implemented and followed. Even if you have a supervisor sitting in there, Who's monitoring the supervisor? You go through all of this rigorous uh, testing before you hire the person. How can it be then that they're only successful in making contacts with their, um, uh, with their clients 53% of the time? The Joint Judiciary Committee wants the parole division to show and prove it's made changes since a high-risk parolee murdered their boss, Tom Clements, and father, Nate Leon. The true issue we're here talking about today and that's how quick do you go out and respond? How quick do you, from the, the time all of the notifications are made, how long is it before you're on the road, and how long is it till you're at their last known address? Ramish acknowledging parole's shortcomings. Our policies are lax. At one point, saying parolees like Evan Ebel should never be released from solitary confinement directly into the community. That's a recipe for disaster. Ramish telling me he's working to change the culture in parole. In the next several weeks, there'll be a lot of emphasis just on going over our policies. I mean, as you well know, some are poor, um, some don't exist. Uh, just going over to make sure that we're all on the same page. 
and legislators plan to follow up. One of the things we're going to be looking for is a pretty comprehensive plan for dealing with these offenders quickly. Only on 7 News doing away with ankle monitoring bracelets like this. That's just one of the options the state may consider to address problems within the Department of Corrections. Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta continues to dig for answers. Police lawmakers now demanding change. And we're getting an idea of what that change might look like. I'm not just talking about tweaking a few policies. The Department of Corrections is attempting what amounts to a 180 degree turn in philosophy that will impact every employee and inmate in the state. One state agency is already doing it, Colorado's Probation Division. It's not a quick process. Eric Phillips started transforming the state's probation division in 2008 using research and intensive studies as the basis for changing the way officers, supervisors, everyone in probation thinks about and does their job. We have really historically talked about compliance with terms and conditions, so what the court orders, and just making sure that there's compliance with that, which is fine while they're under supervision, and we still do that, but what we've added onto that really is around this behavior change. Eileen Kinney is helping Philp implement across-the-board practices that focus on changing criminal behavior through treatment instead of punishment. What are those behaviors that need to get changed that's going to reduce the probability that someone's going to get reinvolved in criminal behavior? And that's a big shift. A huge paradigm shift for anyone working in the courts and corrections. Philp simplifies it like this. Historically, only a small amount of time was spent assessing the criminal's needs and behavior. A case plan is created with the majority of the focus on supervision. Probation has now inverted that pyramid, placing the largest share on assessing the individual and tailoring a plan to help change their behavior. Supervision, while still critical, is as minimal as necessary. The relationship between the office officer and probationer becomes the most critical component. That is huge and that's really about empathy and developing trust and having integrity and, and warmth and genuineness. Officers receive training in motivational interviewing techniques and get proactive constant coaching by their supervisors. And the research shows that punishment is the least effective way to change behavior. So, you know, consequences oftentimes, I think most people hear consequences in a very negative yes. kind of sense, you know, so we don't so much talk about consequences. Was it awkward for you to be doing a presentation before state legislators about what you're doing right when the subject is what another agency is doing wrong? But we've worked closely with parole for years, okay? Uh, they have many of the same challenges that we do. So what was awkward about it was I, I didn't want to be put in a position where it was like, uh, here's a bright shining light and here's complete darkness. Those hearings in September called after our Call 7 investigations uncovered failures in the parole division. Parolee Evan Ebel's ankle monitor alerts ignored as he murdered the former Department of Corrections chief and a father of three. It's not foolproof technology. It doesn't prevent crimes. Philp believes ankle monitors like the one Ebel was wearing are overrated. I think the public thinks oftentimes that that's going to prevent crime and uh, that's not been my experience in 30 years in this business. She was really, really good and really passionate um, at her job and towards me. Hans Bilner says the new approach works. I talked with him on Skype. He says his first time on probation was filled with threats and he eventually reoffended, but he successfully completed probation and started college when an officer talked with him like this. I just want to do whatever it takes to get you through this. Um, you know, you have to pull your own weight, but she gave me the right tools to succeed rather than just trying to find anything to get someone screwed over. For the public, I would say, seeing that those those crime rates are are holding steady not getting worse and potentially going down in some cases um, th that that tells us that some of this is working and now the hope is what works for probation might also work with felons on parole i have confidence that that we will work together as we always have worked together on a variety of these things it's too soon yet for probation to have hard numbers on how well their new approach is working. But in Washington state, which has a similar approach, they've reduced the number of probation violators by 1,000 a year. I'm Call 7 investigator Teresa Martin. It's choice. They'll announce it next year. And the Call 7 investigators with breaking news about Jonathan Sanowski, the man now behind bars who Aurora police say grabbed an 8-year-old girl from her bedroom window. 
Now we're uncovering a history of sexual misconduct kept under wraps until now. Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta breaking this story on our 7 News mobile app tonight. And Teresa, you've learned Sanowski was labeled a sex offender. Long before he was accused of kidnapping an 8-year-old girl, John Sanowski committed crimes that earned him sex offender status. But because those crimes occurred in prison, the only people warned about it are Department of Corrections employees. Years before parolee John Snowski was charged with pulling a little girl through her bedroom window in the middle of the night, the 26-year-old was committing sex offenses in prison. According to documents obtained by the Call 7 investigators, Snowski's formal disciplinary history within the Department of Corrections started back in September of 2007. In each case, he had a hearing and was convicted under the Colorado Penal Code of Discipline, or COPD, not in a court of law. He was convicted of sexual harassment for masturbating in the presence of an officer at the Kit Carson Correctional Center. Four months later, at the Lyman Correctional Facility, Sanowski is convicted of sexual harassment again for masturbating. In April of 2009, now at the Colorado State Penitentiary in Canyon City, another sexual harassment conviction for exposing himself, then making a sexual gesture to an officer. And then, just four months after that, a fourth sexual harassment conviction for sending a note with sexual remarks. Because these were not criminal convictions, the consequences for the offender are only reflected within the prison system itself. We found John Snowski is identified within the DOC as a sex offender, or SXO. Here it is in black and white. But the only place you'll see it is on CWISE, the internal offender tracking system used by the Colorado Department of Corrections. Further confirming his sex offender status, this group email we've obtained sent to paroled sex offenders the morning of Sanowski's arrest, reminding him that he is prohibited from participating in Halloween activities, including decorating his home or keeping his porch light on to entice children. So Sanowski is a sex offender in the eyes of the DOC. But they maintain the public did not need to be warned. In response to my questions, Roger Hudson, a spokesman for the DOC, insists all offenders are evaluated upon entering the CDOC and assigned a sex offender risk level as an assessment tool. Yet my sources confirm only parolee sex offenders are identified in the system with that designation, like this. Sanowski says unhooked sex offender. Hudson also says Sanowski's infractions did not meet the standard to pursue criminal charges. My sources say that's because his offenses in prison involve DOC employees. With or without the filing of criminal charges, the DOC still had the discretion to require a higher level of supervision, but chose not to. I'm Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta. A 7 News alert. Four Marines killed during a training exercise at Camp Pendleton. Now to a Call 7 Investigators exclusive. Lawmakers demanded meaningful changes in the Department of Corrections Parole Division. And your tax dollars are being used for those changes. But Call 7 Investigator Grace Marchetta uncovered some parole officers who question the agency's priorities. And they tell me that they're the ones who have been taking the blame for catastrophic errors uncovered in our series of Call 7 investigations. Tonight, they want to set the record straight about their working conditions, their supervisors, and what they say would have the biggest impact on keeping the public safe from felons on parole. I mean, there was an incident recently where it was over six hours before the on-call officer ever got notified that someone cut their ankle monitor. That recent lapse in notification happened months after policies were changed to alert parole officers sooner and require them to respond faster when parolees tamper with ankle monitors. A policy change after our Call 7 investigation exposed Evan Ebel's parole officer ignored alerts while he committed murder. But these three parole officers speaking to us on the condition we protect their identities say the changes demanded by the Judiciary Committee aren't happening fast enough. What's the biggest change you've noticed since September and the legislative hearings? We got our vests ordered. That's it. New ballistic vests and recently new radios for parole officers. Important steps taken by the DOC after we dug deeper, exposing equipment deficiencies within parole. Now officers say administrators are spending time and money on superficial changes, like changing the name of the parole division and changing the lettering on their uniforms from police to parole. With all the other issues going on right now, really the one thing you want to focus on is what my shirt says, really? It's a change, according to these emails we obtained, many officers object to. I mean, you're always taught arrest control, firearms, stop, police. 
You know what I mean? If you say stop parole, it, it goes against the grain. And why is that a bad idea? It's a terrible idea. It creates a huge officer safety issue. But I will tell you who will see us different is the community when we're out there in their backyard trying to get someone and they just see a dude with a badge around their neck holding a gun. From what I'm hearing, there has not been a whole lot of tangible changes that you've seen. No, no it's, it's window dressing. It's not looking at the issues. Another concern that the DOC administration is out of touch with the challenges officers face. Nobody knows what we're doing. And unrealistic about what they can accomplish with their parolees. I think they got it wrong. I think our primary role is to protect the public. They say high caseloads and the stacks of paperwork that keep them tethered to a desk prevent them from spending more time with the parolees they manage, and that compromises public safety. And I'm tired of seeing parole officers be stomped on by upper management, and I'm tired of seeing us not give our best because of what these policies are. Do you feel like you have a, a management that you can go to yeah. with your concerns? No. You know what we can go to? We can go find another job, and that's what all of us are doing. And they're doing it in part because they say financially they have no choice. And we're already underpaid compared to other market police departments and even other market parole offices around the country. It may sound like sour grapes, but we checked. A community parole officer in Colorado is required to have a four-year degree and must already have a peace officer standard training certification. Pay starts at about $44,000 a year. A Denver police recruit starts at nearly $47,000. In Commerce City, the starting pay just under $53,000. Probation officers in Phoenix start at $47,000. We're losing qualified people, which just makes everybody's case load that much bigger. And bigger caseloads, they say, equals less supervision for felon parolees, putting everyone's safety at risk. Part of the reason the legislature has set aside an extra $10 million for the DOC to use next year as it sees fit. So far, do you think the money and the effort has been going to the right areas? No, no, absolutely not. If you can start a million dollar fugitive unit, there's money. If you could pay an associate director, a six-figure contract, there's clearly money. That new six-figure salary for a new management position added to an already top-heavy agency. How about we stop with all these management levels because our management isn't doing anything for us. You're the only one that can get answers. We ask these same questions, trust me. We've, we've talked and we're blue in the face with this. We can never get any answers. It only seems like you can get answers. So we're desperate. The officers want wireless cards for their computers so they can do paperwork from out in the field. They'd also like the DOC to hire a dispatcher for them to track them on parolee visits and coordinate backup if needed. And they say a parolee's re-entry process needs to start sooner, something Executive Director Rick Ramish has said he wants to do. We'll get a chance to ask him. While he wasn't available for this story, he has committed to speaking with us soon. I'm Call 7 Investigator Teresa Marchetta.